Hello and welcome back to Global Value. In today's video, we're performing a fundamental stock analysis of Nestle. Nestle's ADRs are listed under the ticker NSRG. Nestle is also listed on the Swiss Stock Exchange under the ticker NESN. We're looking at Nestle today as a subscriber request and because they're a consumer staple business. Currently, Nestle's listing in America is trading for $120.18 per share. Over the last year, their stock price is down 11%. Over five years, however, Nestle is compounding at a rate of 6.5% annually. Over 10 years, they're compounding at a rate of 6% annually. And going back prior to the global financial crisis, over the last nearly 18 years, Nestle has compounded at a rate of about 9% annually. Additionally, Nestle has also paid out dividends over this time. Currently, they have a 2.1% dividend yield, and their average dividend yield over this time would be in addition to this compound annual return. Nestle is currently trading snugly between their 52-week high and their 52-week low. They're, about, they're currently right in the middle of that. Nestle is a very large business. They have a market cap of 306 billion Swiss francs, which is is about 332 billion US dollars. So for additional background about the business, with a 150 year plus history, Nestle is the largest food and beverage manufacturer in the world by sales, generating more than 90 billion Swiss francs in annual revenue. Its diverse product portfolios include brands such as Nestle, Nescafe, Per Year, Pure Life, and Purina. Nestle also owns just over 20% of French cosmetics firm L'Oreal. The company has a vast portfolio of global products with more than 30 brands, each achieving more than 1 billion Swiss francs in annual sales. Nestle's geographic presence spans almost 190 countries. Nestle SA was founded in 1866 and is headquartered in Verweil, Switzerland. So for our fundamental analysis today, we are performing the select six analysis, taking a checklist style approach of six standard financial metrics to come to a holistic and beginning understanding of Nestle based off of their business fundamentals. This analysis is still an evolving process, so it will continue to improve and get better over time, and it's an opportunity to learn in public. So with that said, let's get right into today's analysis. Starting things off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital over the last five years to be above 14%. So there are two major reasons for this. The first is that the average publicly listed business earns about a 7% return on capital. And the second is that over the long run, over the course of decades, a stock is likely to return approximately what its underlying business returns. And these business returns are going to be captured here by return on capital. So by asking for a benchmark of 14% or higher, we can potentially build in some margin of safety for ourselves based off the overall quality of the business being about twice as good as average. So Nestle has earned returns on capital that are above this 14% mark in all five of these years. Over this time, their returns on capital have been solidly in this mid-teens range. And over their last 12 months, Nestle has also earned about 15% returns on capital. So averaged out over this period, Nestle is earning about 15.5% returns on capital. So slightly above that 14% benchmark we're looking for. And so this is a check to start things off on metric number one. Next up for metric number two, here we're taking a high level overview of the growth of the business. So we're looking for revenue, net income, and free cash flow growth over the last five years. And this metric is all or nothing in nature. Either all three of these are going to be up for this to be a check, or if even one of them is down, this entire metric will be an X. We'll also be including their last 12 months worth of numbers in our calculations here. Over this time, Nestle's revenues are up just very, very slightly. They've grown their revenues by about 4% over the last five and a half years or so. Looking from 2017 until currently, their earnings have more than doubled over this period. And this was in part because of a $3 billion impairment of goodwill charge that the company took in 2017. So even with that factored in, their earnings have grown over this period. We run into trouble though when we're looking at their free cash flows. Over the last five years, Nestle's free cash flows have declined by 22%. This is potentially concerning because free cash flow is really the number we care about the most here because free cash flow is really the lifeblood of any business and a business's abilities to produce free cash flows now and until judgment day, discounted back by some reasonable interest rate, is ultimately what that business is going to be worth. So a business can use its free cash flows to reinvest back in the business, make acquisitions, buy back shares, pay down debt, or pay dividend. So even though they had slight revenue growth and net income growth over this time, it's not great that their free cash flows are down. And so this is our first X of the day here on metric number two. Next up for metric number three, here we're taking the perspective of an individual shareholder in the business by looking at Nestle on a per share basis. So we're looking for earnings per share growth over the last five years. As we learned in the previous metric, their earnings are up over this period. However, earnings are just the numerator in this earnings per share equation. So we also want to take a look at what they've done in terms of their shares outstanding over this time frame, likely coming as a welcoming sign for long-term shareholders in the business. Over the last five years, Nestle has bought back about 11% of their shares outstanding. So this is important because when you purchase a share of stock, what you're really buying is a fractional ownership percentage in that underlying business. And so when a business buys back stock by decreasing the number of shares that they have outstanding, they're increasing your ownership percentage 
percentage in the business, which is ultimately going to increase the percentage of the business's profits that you're entitled to. So this happens without you having to spend a dime, and it's almost as if the business is making a partial acquisition of itself. So just like with any other acquisition, we want a company to be getting more value than the price that they're paying when they're buying back their shares. In real terms, we'd want the business to be buying back shares when they're trading below their intrinsic value, and it's an attractive use of their capital relative to some of the other uses of what they can do with free cash flows. Nestle's management clearly thought that this was the case over this time frame. However, if you really wanted to understand if these are value additive for shareholders going forward, you'd want to dig in and do some more research on your own here. Still, with more earnings over a smaller number of shares outstanding, this is strong earnings per share growth over the last five years for Nestle here. So this is a check on metric number three. Next up, metric number four is going to be very similar. So here we're looking for free cash flow per share growth over the last five years. This one is going to be a mixed bag as their free cash flows have declined faster than Nestle has repurchased their shares. Again, their free cash flows are down 22% over this period and they've had 11% share buybacks. So over the last 12 months, Nestle has only earned about $2.79 per share, down from where they've been at in any of these years previously and down from where they were at in 2017. So this is an X here on metric number four. So far to recap where we are through four metrics, we are split evenly, two checks and two X's for Nestle. Then next up for metric number five, here we're evaluating how the business is utilizing debt. So we don't want to be investing in overly levered businesses because during economic downturns, it's overly levered businesses that are going to be at the greatest risk of poor outcomes. We want their net debt, which is their total debt minus their cash and their short-term investments to be below the amount of free cash flow that Nestle has produced over the last five years. Nestle ended fiscal 2021 with $36 billion in net debt. Currently, they've increased this by $14 billion. So right now they have $50 billion worth of net debt. However, over the last five years, Nestle has earned $56.3 billion of free cash flow. So even with dramatically increasing their net debt position over the past year, Nestle still has enough free cash flow coming into their business to likely be able to support this, at least on a historical basis over these last five fiscal years. One thing to note is that over their last 12 months with their free cash flows being down over this period, they produced about $8.2 billion worth of free cash flow. If we were to extrapolate that into the future as a potential normal for the business, then it wouldn't look like these debts would be as supported by the business's abilities to produce free cash flows. However, given the nature of Nestle's business as a consumer staple company, it's likely that these higher debts are not as potentially concerning for a business like Nestle, like they would be for some other businesses with potentially worse brands or worse moats overall. So again, this is a check on metric number five on a historical basis here. And so far through our first five metrics, we have three checks and two X's. Then our sixth and final metric, the big metric of them all, we want their average free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. If this is the case, this will give us a slight risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury and potentially give us another reason to be interested in Nestle. We're using their total enterprise value because it's taking into account both their market cap and their net debt position, and it's going to give us a picture of the economic reality of the business that's more similar to as if Nestle were a private company. We learned that over the last five years, Nestle has produced $56.3 billion worth of free cash flow which means that in an average year, they're producing about $11.3 billion worth of free cash flow. So when we divide their $11.3 billion of their average free cash flow by their $384 billion total enterprise value, that gives us an average free cash flow to enterprise value yield of about 2.9%. So that's both below the yield of the 10-year treasury right now, which is about 3.6%, and that's below that 5% benchmark. So on an average basis, this is an X here on metric number six, as it doesn't look like Nestle's currently giving us that risk premium we'd ideally be seeking. Also, again, worth being aware that over their last 12 months, their free cash flows are down from where they've been historically. Again, Nestle has earned $8.2 billion worth of free cash flow over the last 12 months. So to get a current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for the business, when we divide their $8.2 billion of their last 12 months of free cash flow by their $384 billion total enterprise value, that only gives us about a 2.1% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield here. That's even farther below where Nestle has been at on a historical basis. On both a current and an average basis, it does not look like Nestle is currently offering us the adequate risk premium we'd ideally be seeking. However, just because this is an X here on metric number six doesn't mean that you're going to throw out this business in its entirety. This is just one of our six metrics, and this analysis is meant to be taken in holistically. These select six metrics are simple, but when they're combined together, they can be very powerful. Then as a bonus here, we're taking a look at Nestle's dividend profile. 
So Nestle is currently paying out an above average dividend yield of about 2.1%. So that's better than the yield of an S&P 500 ETF currently. However, people make mistakes all the time by blindly chasing dividend yields. So it's important to stop and look at the underlying fundamentals of a business and to determine whether that business can support its dividends with either its earnings or their free cash flows, depending on the type of business. So for Nestle, we want them to be supporting their dividends with their free cash flows. And in all five of their previous fiscal years, this was the case. Nestle paid out a large percentage of their cash flows as dividends in each of these years, maintaining a pretty high dividend payout ratio, but being able to support their dividends. However, over their last 12 months, this has not been the case. Again, Nestle has only produced about $2.79 worth of free cash flow over their last 12 months, meaning that they'd either have to cut their dividend to have it supported by their cash flows or they'd have to be paying this dividend through some other means. Again, the business has already dramatically increased their net debt position over the past year or so. And so while it looks like Nestle will continue paying out a large percentage of its cash flows as dividends to shareholders, whether or not Nestle is able to continue increasing their dividends, especially in the near future, might be up in the air and there's potential uncertainty here just looking at their numbers. Everything we've discussed so far is important, but there's something missing that in my opinion is the main reason to analyze Nestle which takes us on to using a discounted cash flow model to come to a potential fair value for Nestle. So starting with an average of their free cash flows over their last five years, which is above where their current free cash flows are at, then using historical growth assumptions for how the business has been able to grow their free cash flows dating back all the way to 1998. So these are historical growth assumptions that you need to do your own homework on to determine whether or not these are gonna be potentially accurate and applicable going forward to give us a baseline projected estimate of Nestle over the next 20 years or so, using a growth stage for the business where Nestle grows their free cash flows over the next 10 years at a rate of just under 11% annually, then using a terminal stage for the 10 years out after that where that growth rate falls in half, and Nestle continues growing their average free cash flows at a rate of just over 5%. If we were seeking a potential 10% rate of return from the business today, then it looks like a fair value for Nestle is around $67 per share. There are a couple of caveats here. Number one, there are plenty of reasons why this might not be potentially accurate. So this is why it's important that you do your own homework and you learn more about the business. Number two, this discount rate would be including Nestle's dividend payouts. So we would not be doubly counting their dividends. So 2.1% of this would be going to their dividends. And number three, a discounted cash flow model is just like any other model in any other discipline. Its outputs are gonna be sensitive to its inputs. So using these same historical growth assumptions from today's valuations, it looks like you could reasonably expect about a 4% rate of return going forward from Nestle. The same caveats would apply here for this lower discount rate. Please be mindful that this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered legal and financial professionals. In just a minute, we'll talk about our recap for Nestle, but we have to address something first. What are the qualitative aspects of the business, especially the qualitative factors around a potential long or potential short thesis for the business? So starting with some of the key points around a potential long thesis, for Nestle. Number one, with margins lagging some of its large cap peers, there should be plenty of low hanging fruit with which Nestle could improve its financial performance. Number two, Nestle's global distribution network and entrenched supply chain relationships render the company one of the most effective platforms to develop and expand brands on a global scale as seen in its latest partnership deal with Starbucks. And number three, the breadth and diversity of Nestle's portfolio and its geographic reach allow for easy absorption of brand and operational shocks. Then for some of the key points around a potential short thesis for the business, number one, with headcount of around 330,000 employees, change may be difficult to implement for this global packaging food behemoth. Number two, with annual sales of about 90 billion Swiss francs, even blockbuster product launches barely move the needle on Nestle's organic growth rate, limiting the aggregate firm's agility in responding to a changing packaged food landscape. And number three, pricing power in the confectionery business appears to be weakening, particularly in locally tailored products, which could contribute to a slower level of secular growth. Hopefully that offers a balanced perspective around some of the key points around a potential long or a potential short thesis for the business. Now let's get into our recap. So in summary, Nestle checks the box on three out of six of our metrics. They're earning average returns on capital in the mid-teens above that 14% benchmark we were looking for. They very slightly grown their revenues and they've modestly grown their earnings over the last five years. However, their free cash flows are down by more than 20%. Even still during this period, Nestle has repurchased about 11% of their shares outstanding. And while they have added on about $14 billion worth of debt in the past year alone, Nestle's average historical cash flows look like they're able to support this debt load. However, with their current free cash flows coming down from where they have been at, this looks like this would be a higher, potentially more strenuous debt load for the business. Then on both a current and an average basis of their free cash flows compared to their enterprise value, 
That yield did not look like it was giving us the potential risk premium we'd ideally be seeking in comparison to the yield of the 10-year treasury. Looking at Nestle's above average dividend yield, it does not look like Nestle currently has the free cash flows coming into the business to be able to support that dividend payout, let alone grow those unless their free cash flows rebound to where they have been at historically. Then finally, performing a discounted cash flow analysis of Nestle. If you've done the work and you believe those assumptions, it looks like from today's valuations, you could only expect about a 4% rate of return going forward for the business over the next 20 years. And if you were seeking a potential 10% rate of return for Nestle, you'd want their stock price to be valued at about $67 per share. The last time they were near that was in November of 2016. So if that is the case for you, you would just want to be very patient on this business. Again, there are a number of reasons why this might not be potentially applicable. So it's worth reiterating that this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with your financial advisor. This analysis instead serves as a beginning and holistic understanding to help you determine whether it's worth your time and energy to dig in and learn more about Nestle. One resource that will definitely help you stay up to speed with what's going on in the market and help you learn more about the business is Seeking Alpha. Checking out Seeking Alpha directly supports the channel as I'm part of their affiliate program. So most of you probably know Seeking Alpha as a source of community written articles on different stocks. But over the past little while, they've actually become a lot more than that with their new offering, which is Seeking Alpha Premium. Premium has a number of different features where you can track, buy, hold, and sell ratings on your favorite stocks. These ratings are from the Seeking Alpha community, Wall Street analysts, and Seeking Alpha's algorithm. You can see earnings call transcripts, investor presentations, SEC filings, and press releases all in one place. You can add your own margin of safety targets and get alerts for when your favorite stocks hit that level. You can get unlimited access to Seeking Alpha articles, and you can tailor your rating experience based on the type of investor you are. You can get 10 years of financial data on any stock to help you with your analysis. You can also import your portfolio into your Seeking Alpha dashboard to make research easier. And if that didn't convince you, the best thing is that an annual plan is only 99 bucks. That's only 27 cents per day through my referral link down in the description below. Normally premium is $239, but they are currently running a general offer for $119. But if you use my link, it's only 99 bucks. So check it out if you're interested. As a value investor, you ultimately want to learn about a business as if you're going to own 100% of it, and you can truly understand the essence of that business and understand what's important and what's not important for that company going forward. So through this deeper research, you'll ultimately learn more about the qualitative and quantitative aspects of Nestle, and you'll likely be able to determine for yourself what a reasonably appropriate intrinsic value for the company will be. So with that said, that's it for today's fundamental stock analysis of Nestle. Again, they trade in the United States over the counter under ticker symbol NSRG. Those are their ADRs. And they also trade on the Swiss stock exchange under the ticker symbol NESN. We looked at Nestle as a subscriber request today, so I'm happy to make an analysis of the business. So if you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what business you want me to take a look at next time. Thanks for learning about Nestle with me, and have a great day.